Hi everyone and welcome back out to Harvest Hills Ranch. Today we're going to be taking a look at antioxidants in meat and not the antioxidants you're probably thinking about. Most people think about things like vitamin A, vitamin E, vitamin C. Uh, maybe they get into thinking about some minerals like zinc and selenium as antioxidants, but that's not what we're going to be talking about at all today. So we're going to take a look at some of the unique antioxidants that are found in meat and actually what they're able to do for you in terms of improving your health. Hey, I am Dr. Arland Hill and I have a passion for nutrition. I enjoy sharing all things nutrition and whether it's at the farm, whether it's how to help implement nutrition into your family and your household or whether it's just the decisions you're making around food, I'm here to help guys. So with that being said, let's take a look at some of the antioxidants that you can find in meat, specifically the ones that are derived from amino acids. Now, I'm going to be throwing a couple of terms out uh, that may not be household terms as I go through this presentation, but stick with me. I think you're going to find this information extremely enlightening in terms of what the pro or what the uh, antioxidants in meat are able to accomplish for you what they're able to do and also i think it'll give you a bit of a different perspective on consuming meat maybe a, a different viewpoint than what we often hear about a lot of times we think about uh, if we're trying to get antioxidants in our diet we we tend to start thinking about maybe looking at things like fruits or vegetables, uh, typically things that have a lot of color in them. And we often think that the plant-based foods are where those things are coming from. And I'm not trying to stir the pot with this conversation. Really, I'm just trying to introduce a new concept to you and what we think about as an antioxidant and how antioxidants are derived. Now, with that being said, where I want to start us out with this, I want to introduce you to uh, two antioxidants. These are known as carnosine and anserine. And these are going to come from the proteins again in the diet. And I'll speak more specifically about that in just a moment. I'll show you some information uh, in regards to where these particular uh, amino acids, uh, these are actually two amino acids put together. Uh, I'll show you where these come from in the diet and which food sources are best for this. But most of the time when we talk about consuming a protein, ultimately what we think about is that that protein is a very big structure of amino acids. Uh, those amino acids form long chains. They start to fold around on themselves and create different structures in the body. They get reassembled to create these structures. But ultimately when we're consuming these protein sources in our diet, the ultimate goal of digestion as it relates to, to proteins is to get those proteins down to their smallest size. And we either have to get those down to a single amino acid, two amino acids, or three amino acids. If we're absorbing anything larger than three amino acids together, then we probably have the proverbial leaky gut, and there's likely some dysfunction going on in the GI tract. Now, interestingly enough, one of the antioxidants here, carnosine, does have some benefit as it relates to the GI tract, uh, specifically when combined with zinc. But the point being on this is that there are unique attributes to consuming or assimilating some of these individual amino acids. So once they just it's one single amino acid, they're going to have some benefit there. But we also know that there's benefit when these amino acids stay in what's known as a dipeptide. And a dipeptide is simply nothing more than two amino acids that have stayed together. If it was three, it would just be called a tripeptide. But for the purpose of our conversation today, we're going to be talking about two of these amino acids together. Now, these are going to be based in two amino acids, actually both of them. They're based in beta alanine and histidine. So what we're doing with the carnosine and the anserine is we're taking those two amino acids of histidine and the beta alanine and they're being combined. The primary difference between carnosine and anserine is just a carbon and hydrogen group, what we often talk about as a methyl group. Uh, outside of that, they're fairly similar structures. Uh, but there are some unique differences because of that uh, carbon hydrogen group, that methyl group there. And we'll, we'll point to some of those differences. But with that being said, I want you to think about these as antioxidants. And what I want to show you with these antioxidants is, first of all, I want you to think about them differently than just simply thinking about a, 
a vitamin or a mineral playing an antioxidant role or even a polyphenol or a flavonoid, some of these other terms, these colorful elements that we often associate with plants, those are often what are talked about as, uh, as antioxidants, but proteins can have antioxidant effects too. And so one that, just to create some familiarity for you, one that we do talk about that is a uh, an amino acid or a protein-based antioxidant that we can get through our diet, but we often make this, is glutathione. Uh, glutathione is considered maybe a master antioxidant in some way. It's considered one of the more uh, potent antioxidants in the body. But the, the, long life, the, the utility of glutathione really comes down to its ability to be recycled. Uh, there are also some things about carnosine and answerine that make it unique in terms of being a part of our skeletal muscle tissue in regards to some of the antioxidant roles that it has there. But that's a, a, a bit of a background and introduction there to this. Let's talk about some of the specifics that we can get into here with looking at uh, these two antioxidants. So what I want to do is I'm going to show you where, first of all, these have been shown to have benefit. And so we're talking about carnosine over here. You'll notice that in regards to gastrointestinal health, carnosine can have some benefit. And think about this in, in relation to your day-to-day -day choices. If you're thinking about, do I choose a protein or do I choose a plant or should I avoid, maybe the better question is, should I avoid the protein to optimize my gastrointestinal health? I think this is an indication that we can begin to rethink that strategy. And we also see ideas around, uh, I mentioned earlier, especially if carnosine is, is combined with zinc, that that is a very potent uh, therapeutic for the gastrointestinal tract. It actually helps heal the GI tract and makes the lining of the gastrointestinal tract more efficient and allows us to turn the cells in the gut over more frequently. And the unique thing about that is that those cells turn over fast anyway, so we need them to be optimal. Uh, you'll see a few other areas over here, so carnosine and anserine. You'll see that literally everything from the retinal health down to the immune system health, which we often hear so much about now. And even in terms of looking at metabolic health, where we're thinking in regards to uh, blood sugar metabolism, how do we balance our blood sugar, these are all areas where we can start to see some benefits from both carnosine and anserine. And so again, this is a different thought process than often what's heard. We often hear that if you consume proteins that, especially red meat is often uh, villainized for this, that it's going to increase your risk of cardiovascular disease. And the, the information just when you look at it in more detail, it just simply doesn't hold water on that. There's there's a lot of assumptions that are made in those statements, and I think we can do better than that, especially when we start to mechanistically look at the effects of some of these components of protein that do have positive health outcomes or do show positive health outcomes. Now, how, how does all this work? Well, I think to, to understand this, we need to look at uh, first what it is that the carnosine can actually do for us. And what I want to show you here, and this is a little bit of a prelude. Again, I told you I was going to share with you in detail where these come from. But notice that this is actually showing carnitine and, uh, or not carnitine, carnosine. Um, those two do get confused. So carnosine and carnitine are different. Uh, but in this case, carnosine and anserine. And this was found from chicken. And what this shows is that it quenches the acrylamide that's often associated with cooking. So, for example, maybe potatoes are often uh, villainized for this. Acrylamides are something that when you brown your meat or you're trying to flavor your meat, um, that, that crispiness that you're trying to uh, achieve when you cook the meat or grill the meat a bit longer that is going to lead to the production of acrylamide. And acrylamide has been suggested to have some potential for uh, generating a uh, for generating a carcinogenic effect, so potentially promoting of cancer. And again, there's some there's some iffiness about this in terms of really what the problem is here. But by and large, it's probably not a good idea to get excessive amounts of acrylamide. Um, these 
these do have some toxicant profiles or have a toxicant profile. So things like potatoes are especially well known for this. Acrylamide is also found in coffee. Uh, so the the carnosine and the anserine here are two uh, or two amino acids or two uh, dipeptides. It's a combination of amino acids that are actually being shown to quench this. And so the way that this works is when you start looking at the uh, some say for example you're consuming chicken in this case and that chicken is going to have the carnosine and anserine both in there there are different concentrations in different parts so for example the breast and the and the thighs are, or the drumsticks are going to be different but this is one way to potentially neutralize those acrylamides that people often associate with being carcinogenic and maybe maybe it is maybe it isn't right now I think we need more data to really be able to, to confirm that but again probably not I deal to heavily, heavily uh, brown or especially burn your meat to any significant degree. But regardless, you're going to see some neutralization of those acrylamides with adequate uh, amounts of carnosine and anserine consumption. So another reason to look at consuming these protein sources with whether it is a potato, not necessarily being a french fry here as the picture illustrates, or whether you're looking at consuming this with coffee. I'm um, like most Americans, uh, we enjoy coffee in our household, and so um, in so doing, we would if there is a risk here, we would like to be able to neutralize that, and it seems like these foods certainly have the capacity to be able to do that. Now, in regards to a bit of a different approach here, one of the ways that these uh, these two uh, combinations, these dot peptides, work is they can help offset the negative effects of oxidative stress. Now, another way of thinking about this is simply just saying inflammation. Um, there are multiple types of inflammation. Uh, you have inflammation that's derived or associated with oxygen. You have some that's associated with nitrogen. You have some that's associated with carbon species. And I'm going to take a specific look at the ones that are associated with carbon species because that is ultimately one of the things that is associated with us as humans when we talk about organic chemistry or living tissue you're going to find carbon in that tissue and so if we go back and we look at this illustration that I have here and the way that this whole process of the oxidative stress and the formation of these carbonyl species when the fats these polyunsaturated fatty acids or the sugars that are coming in through your diet when these are ultimately damaged they're going to contribute to the production of these reactive carbonyl species and the reason that these are problematic is that they can negatively affect proteins they can start to interact and uh, bind with proteins and ultimately what begins to happen is they create a protein that is no longer the same protein that we in, endogenously or internally find that protein even though it's still within our body starts to look unique it starts to look different and we need to find ways to overcome that and so if we don't what ultimately begins to happen is we start to develop these AGEs these are known as advanced glycation end products these are the ones that are associated with sugar or we develop these advanced lipooxygenation end products and regardless of which one of these whether it's a damaged sugar or whether it's a damaged uh, these are damaging the fats in the body and creating an inflammatory cascade from that you ultimately end up with a form of damaged tissue in the body that if that persists and accumulates for a long enough period of time that's where you start to get into cellular and organic dysfunction and this is probably the most well-known example on this we can I'll actually give you two examples on this one probably the more well-known on this is going to be diabetes uh, this is where we start to see these advanced glycation end products they start to damage the the vascular tissue in the body uh, the small vessels this is why we see issues around the kidneys the eyes when when we're talking about more advanced states of diabetes and the other area we see this is is with neurodegenerative conditions so for example Alzheimer's uh, Alzheimer's is uh, those tissues uh, and the, the uh, nervous tissue the neurons are susceptible to these advanced glycation end products and the advanced lipo oxygenate or uh, oxidation end products so point being again is that both sugars and fats are damaged and ultimately if that damage persists for a long enough period of time and continues to accumulate you're going to end up with some some damaged tissue in the body you're going to end up with a system of your body that is not optimally functioning now again 
how do we neutralize this? How do we negate this? Well, I take us all the way back again to the anserine and the carnosine, these components of proteins in our diet that can help offset a lot of this issue for us. Now, I do want to go back to where do we find these at? And to do that, uh, I'm actually going to use this study out of the critical reviews in food science and nutrition to help uh, isolate this. And you'll see that there's different concentrations that are found in different areas. Uh, for example, in uh, your swine, your beef, your turkey, um, you're going to have greater amounts of carnosine in those. Uh, I'll, I'll speak to this predominantly from what we are currently producing uh, here at Harvest Hills Ranch. We have we offer grass-fed and finished beef, and so that beef is going to have a higher concentration of carnosine in comparison to anserine. Now you flip that the other direction when you start talking about the poultry, our pastured poultry operation that we have here, where the anserine is inherently higher in that muscle tissue compared to carnosine. So there are some species differences here that we can think about, uh, again, in relation to many of the mechanisms and in terms of what we can see long-term benefit, there is a bit of overlap, not 100%, but there is some overlap there just because of the uh, similarities in the structure of these of carnosine and anserine. But also, when we look at this, I want you to see another point to this, which is that you'll notice that anserine and carnosine are found in greater concentrations in muscles high in white fibers with chicken white muscle containing over five-fold more anserine than and carnosine than in red muscle. So, you know, when we talk about the, for example, the white meat or the dark meat in a chicken, when we're thinking about the white meat being a chicken breast and we think about the dark meat being the drumsticks, in, in this case, your, your chicken breasts are going to have higher amounts of carnosine and anserine than do the drumsticks. And it doesn't mean that the drumsticks don't have it. They, they do. They just don't have it to the same concentration that we would find it in the chicken breast. So it, this is also, I think, a, a unique conversation, too, because a lot of times we hear about... we Well, let me phrase this different. A lot of times we don't hear about the nutritional value in terms of the components in the uh, chicken or poultry meat that can uh, lead to positive health effects. And these are simply two components that are inherently found in that, especially when we start talking about this uh, being raised from a pastured system where you're optimizing the nutrition or making, uh, should be, we do, make an attempt to optimize the nutrition for that animal, we would anticipate that there is going to be a higher amount of carnosine and anserine in there. And since both of these are coming from histidine, they're, they're uh, associated with histidine, uh, that's part of their structure, we do pay attention to the amount of histidine in the diets of our animals to ensure that they have the initial building blocks or they're taking in the proteins that are going to help with the production of carnosine and anserine in that muscle tissue. So those are considerations that we do make. There was one final point that I wanted to share with you just in regards to uh, the effects that these can particularly have. You'll notice that anserine and carnosine are thought to inhibit lipid oxidation by a combination of free radical scavenging and metal chelation. This is interesting to me because when we start talking about metal chelation, we can do this aggressively. We can do it in a very uh, benign fashion on an ongoing basis. And this is an illustration that whether it's the carnosine and anserine that's coming in from the diet, glutathione, which can also be made from proteins in our diet, has the ability to do this. These are going to be components of the protein. And again, it's not differentiating whether it's just beef or just turkey. It's the beef, the chicken, the turkey, the the pork, if that's something you eat, those are all going to have these concentrations. Again, we, we predominantly for, focus on on the beef and the and the poultry, but these are going to be benefits that you're you're going to derive from consuming those protein sources that maybe when you first looked at it, you didn't think, and maybe you don't think on a daily basis, hey, I'm having some metal chelation effects. So these metals that 
are ex that I'm exposed to in my environment that maybe sometimes I don't even realize I'm exposed to, whether that's lead, cadmium, mercury, what, whatever that is, these are going to be ways that through that chelation activity, we can start to benignly and slowly grab that up over time and reduce our body burden on that by consuming adequate amounts of proteins in our, in our diet on a daily basis. So that's where you're going to find different amounts at. Now, there's one other thing that I want to show you here, and this goes back to a contrast just to show you that the, the some of the, the conversation we hear in regards to uh, balancing our acid-base chemistry is maybe not complete. And the thing that I'll focus on with this is going to be the pH buffering ability of the uh, of carnosine and answering in the in the muscle tissue and so this is the acid base balance and one of the things that we can see with this is I want you to think in regards to when you've exercised and you go out you do that exercise and you start to feel that muscle burn that lactic acid accumulation in the muscle tissue literally what's happening with that accumulation of lactic acid is you're taking the sugars, the glycogen that is in the muscle tissue, and you're breaking that down, you're forming lactate and kicking off a hydrogen with that, and that gives us our lactic acid. Uh, to illustrate that more specifically, let me show you this particular diagram, but you'll notice on this, as I just mentioned, that from that glycogen, we get the lactate and the hydrogen. One of the things to keep in mind is that the more of these hydrogens you accumulate, the more acidic the environment becomes. And naturally, through the energy production process and through the working activity of the muscle, we're going to convert more glycogen because we're burning that energy source in that muscle. And we're ultimately taking any of this stored ATP, which is our energy molecule, and we are making that into ADP and we're converting that glycogen to lactate. And either way, we're kicking out a free hydrogen here. So what ultimately happens over time is we get several of these hydrogens that begin to accumulate. That's the burn you feel, that lactic acid accumulation. And one of the ways that we can begin to uh, minimize that. We can't completely uh, we can't completely avoid that. I mean, there's going to be continued production of that hydrogen, but we can buffer that for a period of time. And so, what happens is this bigger structure you see over here. This is going to be carnosine, and literally, the carnosine is picking up these hydrogens and it neutralizes it. So now, whereas for example, you may have developed that lactic acid after, say, eight reps of an activity. Now you're possibly not developing that burn until rep 10, and maybe you can squeeze out rep 11 and rep 12. So any activity that you're engaging in that is creating a demand on your muscle tissue where you're feeling that burn, you're going to be able to extend that for a longer period of time because you're offsetting that accumulation of the, the hydrogen. And again, we tend to think about that as lactic acid. There's other contributors there, but ultimately that's going to be a buffering response. So there is a pH buffering activity from these two compounds. And so as you think about, as we come to start, as I start to wrap up here, as we think about these, about these compounds, I want you to, again, Look at these differently in your diet. I want you to look at those protein sources differently and not simply look at that as that's just dietary protein that I need to take in to build muscle. It's actually much greater than that. There's a lot of these secondary metabolites that are in our, our uh, uh, meat sources, our protein sources, especially the ones that we know that are raised on pasture. I'll speak more to that in other videos. You get the antioxidants in there. You get the vitamins, the minerals. And now you can also look at this and say, I'm not just getting these single amino acids that can have their own benefit here and there. I am also getting these combinations of amino acids, two of them combined together that are dipeptides, right? So two of them combined together. And they are unique. Our body looks at those and uses those in a very unique manner as well. And so we can see that they have antioxidant capacity and they can even offset 
some of the potential risk factors that are associated with progression of disease. So I gave you an example of the acrylamides that being a toxicant if it's uh, likely overconsumed. Uh, heavy metals being another consideration since there's a metal chelation possibility here. So there's a lot of health benefits that you may derive from this and a lot of tissues throughout the body that could benefit. Now, listen, guys, if you're interested in trying to get more of this kind of food into your diet and you're trying to figure out where do I get that from, check out HarvestHillsRanch.com. We offer grass-fed and finished beef, pasture poultry, uh, free-range eggs. So these are all great sources of protein that you can uh, include into your diet to reap some of the benefits that we've been talking about. And if you feel like you need some personalized help with this, uh, you need someone to help guide you through this, you can check out DrArlandHill.com, which is my clinic website, and see how I work with patients, some of the resources that I have available there. If you need help, I'd, I'd love to help you out and keep you moving forward on your health journey. So until next time, guys, thanks again for joining today, and we'll speak with you in the near future. Take care.